So, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Maroon. I'm the CEO and co-founder of WattLearn. Uh, WattLearn is a startup company based here in Pittsburgh where we're building uh, an artificial intelligence software platform to better manage battery systems. So basically we're using machine learning to give batteries a brain, uh, help them maximize both the value and life of those systems on the grid. Um, but today we're going to talk about next generation in energy storage systems. So I think everyone uh, recognizes over the past 10 years or so, batteries have been, been a ubiquitous part of our life. So from batteries that we now carry uh, everywhere with us to electric vehicles, um, to the batteries that are being installed on the grid to manage intermittency of renewables, provide backup power, uh, and all sorts of other grid services. So what we're going to talk about here um, with the panel that's, I would say, much smarter than me, um, are wh what's happening in research. So everything from advanced materials to uh, how we measure and collect and analyze data, how is all of that uh, giving better uh, information to make better systems, to make better battery technologies. So uh, just moving down to introductions, so I don't, uh, don't think I need to introduce Jay, who's the moderator of today's session. Um, next to Jay is uh, Ted Wiley. So Ted is the co-founder and CEO of Forum Energy. Um, Ted began his career with the US Army as an infantry officer, and then went on to become co-founder and head of product at Aquion Energy. Uh, before moving to Forum, he was president of McDonough Innovation. And um, Forum is a startup focused on long duration energy storage to really enable widespread adoption of renewables. So moving closer and closer to baseload. Uh, next to Ted, Venkat Vishwanathan. He is the assistant professor of mechanical, chemical engineering, and material science here at Carnegie Mellon. His research group has, led, uh, has broad expertise in energy storage and lithium ion, specifically as they pertain to electric vehicles and planes. His focus is on identifying the scientific principles governing material design, inorganic, organic, and biomaterials for novel ener energy conversion and storage routes. Uh, next, James Fleetwood, who's the research director for the Battery Innovation Center uh, in South Central Indiana. He works with the cell manufacturing team at the Battery Innovation Center, which fabricates novel electrode materials, optimizes performance parameters with a focus on prototype performance evaluation and scale up to commercialization. And lastly, Eli Leland, the co-founder and chief product officer of Voltaic. Um, Eli serves as the company's chief product officer and guides the Voltaic product roadmap as well as post-sale customer experience. Eli and his co-founder Tal started Voltaic in 2012 in order to address data analysis workflow challenges um, that they personally encountered while running RPE energy storage research projects at SUNY Energy Institute in New York City. Thank you so much, Matt. And I'd quickly thank our, uh, our distinguished panel for coming. And I've asked Matt to sit up here as well, mainly because he's so handsome. Uh, we need some of that help. Uh, Ted also told me to start with a joke. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to ask e each panelist first the same question, and they're going to answer from their own context uh, what they think about it. And, and we have a couple of those and some individual questions, then we'll open it up uh, to the floor. So please do use uh, the app and the instructions are on the table to, to use that. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll start with Ted, uh, and the first question is about sort of what happened, what's happened in the past 10 years. And I was thinking last night, it was nine, about nine years ago, you and I were on the fourth floor of Wien Hall in my cinder block office writing a $5 million proposal to the DOE to get ARRA uh, money, uh, which we won, uh, and we just made some real tall promises. Uh, and we delivered on, on those, and, and then sort of uh, it, chaos ensued. Um, but, uh, and, and so I, you start off, but I'd love to hear everyone else's opinion. What has happened in your world in the, in the past 10 years of energy storage, um, just to frame the context as we talk about next generation research? Yeah, that's great. Uh, 10 years ago, I was in business school, and uh, a really amazing kind of important thing happened to me. There was this field study class called Building Green Businesses, and uh, each, the groups of two or three students uh, got to select a project 
and uh, work with somebody out in the outside world on something in the green clean tech space. And me and two others selected a project called Stealth Battery Company, uh, which was backed by Kleiner Perkins. And uh, that was Jay. Uh, and what happened was Kleiner had provided some research money to Jay to start evaluating uh, new alternatives to ultra low cost energy storage. So over the subsequent six months, we did a field study project for Jay, at the end of which uh, I was looking for a job because I was graduating from my MBA. And the, the Kleiner partner suggested I come out and meet Jay uh, and see if it might be interesting to help him spin the company out of his lab at Carnegie Mellon. I came out here in May uh, of 2009, and we immediately got along. We had a shared worldview, a, a shared passion for sustainability and clean energy. Uh, and we said, yeah, let's do this. So I, I moved to uh, Pittsburgh full time, and uh, I lived there for the, the next six years. I met my wife. Uh, at that time, lithium ion batteries were about $1,200 a kilowatt hour. Uh, you know, Dave mentioned a, a precipitous decline from you know, uh, $1,000 a kilowatt hour in 2010 to uh, you know, maybe uh, in, the, in the hundreds to 100 now for the battery pack. Um, we, Jay and I, started Aquion Energy, which was uh, an alternative to lithium ion for stationary energy storage. Uh, we built a manufacturing, our team built a manufacturing facility. Matt was on our team, uh, as are some others that are in the audience today. Uh, and we, we sort of went through what I might call battery 1.0, which was uh, developing technologies and uh, trying to find an application in the market to use them for. Uh, and thinking about also how do you make the market for energy storage? So how do you develop the technology? How do you find a useful application? And how do you convince people to buy? So we were, we were creating a market as an industry at the same time we were creating technologies. Uh, and you know, at that time, the biggest batteries that were being deployed were you know, megawatt batteries, one megawatt for 15 minutes, for instance. Uh, and you know, today, uh, hundreds to soon thousands of megawatt hours of batteries are being deployed yearly uh, around the world. So the, you know, this has gone from an experimental idea that was really at the fringe of the global electricity industry to something that people consider to be one of the big solutions going forward for the grid. And it's been incredible to watch and be a part of. Yeah, so uh, 10 years ago, uh, roughly, I started graduate school. Um, and uh, I came to Stanford. Um, and uh, I think one useful thing that happened was um, I, I did my undergrad at IIT, which is a place of perfect competition. Um, and so uh, one uh, amazing thing that happened was most of my friends, close friends, ended up on the East Coast. Uh, and so I was sort of the loner there on the West Coast. And that, that fundamentally changed my thinking, uh, at least in terms of um, uh, decoupling difficulty of problem uh, and importance of problem. Uh, and I think um, that sort of uh, is my journey into becoming an accidental electrochemist. Um, so uh, I, I started my graduate school. I wanted to work on uh, fluid mechanics, which is uh, if, you're, if you did mechanical engineering as uh, an undergrad, that's probably one of the topics that you would think is hard. Um, I, I came into graduate school uh, in the division of computational fluid dynamics. Um, quickly realized there are not many important things to be done in that field. Uh, and then the second accident that happened was uh, I did a summer internship at Bosch, uh, and they defined a problem in batteries. And I'd done nothing in batteries up until that point. Um, this is just a message to many of you that uh, may be uh, thinking about getting into batteries and, and have no background. Um, I had no background uh, eight years ago, and I'm here. so. Uh, uh, so I think that you know, everyone can get there um, by, by spending the right amount of time on it. Um, so uh, I, I, I switched uh, sort of midway through my PhD to, to think on lithium ion uh, and, and next generation uh, chemistries related to lithium air. Um, and um, and, I, and I, I, I interviewed here uh, actually as a graduate student. Uh, Jay, was, uh, Jay was in the audience. Uh, uh, and, and he asked the sort of meanest, toughest questions uh, when I was interviewing. Uh, the, the seminar's up on YouTube, so there's like proof that that happened. Um, and, and so um, then I started my, then I came here uh, after a brief stint uh, at MIT, and I, I came here, uh, started a group um, uh, largely thinking about uh, electrification, uh, mostly on vehicles. Uh, and the sort of big question that we were trying to answer was, uh, was how can we design um, 
organic electrolytes. Uh, I think that was the one piece that I felt uh, there was a lot of art to it, uh, and, and, and we wanted to try and change uh, that uh, process of, uh, of thinking about electrolytes. Um, and so um, I'm not an organic chemist, so we, we thought about big data long before big data was, was sort of a, a huge buzzword. Uh, but I think you know we've we've made phenomenal progress. You know I lead a, a team of about 20 other uh, accidental electrochemists, uh, and I think they will all attest to that. Uh, but I think that's uh, you know it's been phenomenal to have uh, a group of very uh, uh, interesting mix from you know physics, uh, uh, chemical engineering, Mackey, uh, material science, and so on. So um, I think it's been a great journey, and and uh, you know I look forward to the the next. 10 years of my career looking at sort of, you know, battery 2.0, I guess. Yes. James. All right. So 10 years ago, I was also thinking about grad school just about to enter. I was actually uh, excited for working at uh, a gas turbine engine manufacturer. I've always been interested in energy storage, energy conversion, um, energy generation. And so I started off gas turbine engines, thermal barrier coatings, and I saw this opportunity for fuel cells, and I ended up doing all my grad school work uh, on hydrogen fuel cells, particularly developing the solid electrolytes. Uh, and along the way, the BIC was uh, just, they were just building the foundations at the time, and uh, near the end, they had opened the doors, and I'd started to hear this opportunity. I'd also spent all this time in grad school on some very interesting work. You know, uh, a lot of people had ended up working at it, the BIC, worked on various fuel cells, um, a polymer is more, more commonly, me, solid oxide fuel cell. Uh, certainly a very efficient form, um, and working on solid electrolyte gave me some interesting experience there. Uh, but I wanted to be a little bit closer to something in, in a more practical use, widespread use. I saw that, that lithium ion batteries had developed so much, and I saw that the BIC was uh, in that facilitator role, that final hurdle to take it from university to end user, um, to, to help, these, help early researchers with very minimal amounts of money access the equipment that they need to prove their technology on a larger scale, large enough that the big million cell per year plus manufacturers are gonna go out there and and really look at them uh, seriously and trust the data from that third party. So it's just a very exciting opportunity. Um, and I did find that, as I mentioned, a fair number of people that I've worked with in the battery industry now were fuel cell workers in the past. I think that's, that's been a jump that I've noticed is a, a lot of fuel cell researchers kind of are jumping on board the battery train. Both technologies, of course, have uh, very good applications of the future, but here we're talking about batteries and energy storage, and um, that's where I started, really, was three and a half years ago in, in terms of lithium-ion batteries, and I would say half of the work that we've done at the BIC in that time has all been developing various aspects of the silicon chemistry, from active material makers to binder um, makers to uh, electrolyte makers. Every, every little piece has really been necessary um, and that can be the challenges. Everyone has one of the pieces of the solution. And the BIC tries to make them share that information, but everyone, of course, it's very difficult to develop a product and protect your intellectual property. Um, but I would say that most of the individual pieces of the technology are out there and that it's a matter of sharing your information and you would actually get there. There would be high silicon content commercial cells. So, I mean, you guys are a test house, right? So you, you get these uh, samples in or units in from a variety of places and test them? Yes, we, uh, I've probably worked with maybe a dozen different silicon uh, anode developers. They send whatever piece of the, pro of the end cell that they make, they send it to us. Uh, we work in some sort of collaborative way. They maybe come to the BIC as well. And we try to develop their cell uh, as a collaborative process and test it with an uh, independent third party. You wall off between the different competitors, I presume, though, too. Uh, right? Yes, it's a careful process, uh, <laughs> but we've managed, we manage. Um, and then there's uh, one of the other things we try to do is if there is something that's shared, or the opportunity to share, we basically have like a black box process. You can put your thing, every company can put their thing into the black box. We don't tell you what it is, but we'll show you the performance results after the fact. And if they're so stunning, maybe you'll start sharing that information, and that has actually happened in the past. Um, 
But yeah, for the most part, silicon has been where we've seen a lot of development and, and electrolyte and high voltage electrolytes. Okay. Um, it's been the big part of the work, I'd say. Perfect. Eli? Uh, like uh, the rest of my co-panelists, I was in school 10 years ago, uh, finishing a PhD in mechanical engineering. I uh, had nothing to do with batteries. I knew I wanted to work on energy, wasn't quite sure where to go with it. Um, brief detour through DC in a policy fellowship, decided I uh, did not want to go that route either, really wanted to go back to working on technology. Uh, so I had an opportunity to move to New York City uh, to lead an ARPA-E research project developing a new type of capacitor-based uh, power converter, DC to DC converter for electricity. And in that same lab, there was another ARPA-E project working on a new grid-scale energy storage technology based on uh, alkaline materials. So basically taking the, the cheap materials in a Duracell battery and scaling it up, making them cyclable uh, for grid applications. Um, so in that lab, uh, I was... Uh, I was, in my work, I was uh, leading a team that was developing capacitors, we're making lots of prototypes, we're doing a lot of testing, a lot of data analysis. And my counterpart on the grid scale storage uh, process, uh, project was doing the same. And, um, you know, we had, our group had developed some very rudimentary tools to help us uh, accelerate those data analysis workflows, basically so we could look at the, our data uh, in a web browser instead of having to go into the lab and download it on a USB stick, put it in a spreadsheet, et cetera. And um, uh, with apologies to our sponsors at ARPA-E, it turned out that the, uh, those software tools that we were working with were actually generating a lot more commercial interest uh, than the energy storage technologies that we were developing on those grants. Um, they were helping us get papers out faster, get patents out faster, and we were actually, you know, people who would come through to visit the lab uh, actually wanted to know about uh, how, could, could they get the software that we were using rather than, you know, could they license or partner with us on our hardware. Um, you know, so we took that hint uh, that there might be a commercial opportunity um, to build a software uh, platform, a software product targeted specifically towards the engineering analysis challenges in batteries and energy storage and their applications. Um, so that's what we did. And uh, we, you know, early on we, um, one, of those, one of those inquiries about, you know, could they get their hands on our software, we took that opportunity to uh, do a sort of one-off consulting project as a proof of concept. Myself and my co-founder, the guy who was leading the, the battery project, uh, who actually had previously done fuel cells as well before he moved over to batteries. Um, uh, so we did that proof of concept project. We raised uh, SBIR grant money from Department of Energy and National Science Foundation uh, to get the company off the ground and sort of scaled it from there. And, uh, you know, here we, that was 2012, and here we are uh, about six years later, and you know, we're, we're working with companies sort of across the spectrum of batteries and their applications, from early stage R&D, um, other independent test centers, uh, automotive companies, consumer electronics, sort of, um, you know, we, we sort of found this opportunity in this gigantic global industry of batteries and energy storage and their applications, which in aggregate is a huge global market, and there's really uh, a need for dedicated software tools in that market, so that's, um, that's, that's what we're building as a company, uh, Voltaic. Um, I'd say the other thing you know, that early on led to this inspiration was um, not being uh, a battery person originally and sitting in a lab uh, at City College of New York with a bunch of other battery researchers, I was hearing people complain constantly about uh, how the state of the art of predictive models for battery performance uh, was terrible. In academia and industry, people were doing, trying all kinds of like supercomputer simulations, things like that. Um, and, and not really coming up with a lot of practical results. And so, you know, perhaps being naive, I, uh, I sort of asked the question, well, is anybody taking the big data approach and just trying to collect as much data as you can and, and be empirical? So look at the, you know, uh, the actual performance data of how these batteries are performing as well as, you know, all the metadata that you can get about how they were built, what sort of processes, materials, et cetera. And it turned out that, uh, that nobody was doing that. Um, and one of the big reasons was that nobody could uh, get enough data into one place in order to, you know, get a meaningful data set that would be useful in that kind of study. Um, so that's sort of the dual, uh, the sort of two things that we're focused on at Voltaic is really uh, getting all that data into one place and then doing interesting and valuable things with it for our customers. Perfect, thanks. So this is uh, evidence that if you want to work in batteries, don't start studying batteries. You should move on to something else uh, later on. No, I mean, and this is one of the main reasons I wanted to, to eat the, your personal stories out a little bit, is in fact what's happened in the past decade is that there was almost no battery research in North America 10 years ago. Uh, very little. 
Um, and there's been such an influx of funding, support, interest, and indeed, you know, markets that have evolved in the past decade that you've seen these holes filled by people like this who have seen the opportunity, uh, responded to funding from the DOE and, and RPE and other places, and have created entire careers uh, and, and industry around it. So it's super exciting um, that, that, that this whole class of people, and for each one on the, uh, on, on the stage before you, there's tens and tens and hundreds elsewhere in the United States who, who are like them. Um, so this is a huge movement that's occurred um, in part because of folks like Dave Danielson and others who have pulled the trigger on a lot of funding and support for energy storage. So um, the need is there, uh, the perceived need, the real need, uh, and this is the answer to, to those questions. All right, so second question, and we're going to try to go a little bit faster here uh, now that we've sort of set, set the stage. Uh, what is battery 2.0? When I say battery 2.0 to you, what does it mean? Okay, I have some ideas about this, and I'll try to go quickly to your point. Uh, battery 1.0 to me was technology driven. I think that the major innovations that will happen will be uh, led by the market need this time. And that means that there's going to be sophisticated techno-economic modeling that starts from the beginning and considers the full landed system. I'm thinking mostly stationary batteries here, but probably also in cars. Uh, it will be market needs driven for the innovations and that, that market need will drive the technology development process. Uh, I think that for, there's probably two classes of battery 2.0, high performing and very, very low cost. And in particular for very low cost, I think that battery 2.0 will not really have synthetic chemicals involved. It's going to be simple, naturally occurring, uh, very abundant materials because we need to go down an order of magnitude more in cost. Thank you. 2.0. I'll try to, I'll try to uh, get to this as fast as possible. So to get to 2.0, we need to know where 1.0 has gotten us. And, and so um, I think uh, largely, uh, this is sort of uh, my, my current uh, thesis. One point, with 1.0, uh, we will electrify uh, nearly all markets of transportation, including uh, heavy duty trucking, um, with some slight changes in behavior, um, and uh, probably with some enhancements and charging which will happen. Um, so which means uh, then uh, the question is, you know, what is 2.0? Uh, and, and for me personally, you know, uh, I think uh, the the biggest um, the biggest uh, emission, at least uh, from a personal stand, standpoint, is flying. Uh, I, I fly 100,000 miles a year. Not proud of it, um, and my body doesn't like it. Uh, and so we would like to try and electrify planes. Um, I think it's not as hard as people might imagine. Uh, so I think that's one piece uh, of battery 2.0, at least personally. The second thing, uh, which I think uh, gets to many of the things that people have been talking about, is in the battery business, the problem is uh, when people tell you something, um, there's, uh, people tell you many things, uh, all of which could be true, uh, but they're all uh, never simultaneously true. Um, and, and so as a result, uh, there's sort of a huge mistrust um, in the battery field. Um, and I think uh, part of this uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, that it's a hard problem, you know, you know multi-physics, multi-dimensional, and so on. So I think data is going to be a key layer uh, as we go forward. Uh, and so uh, I think um, having data fill the gap um, uh, and, and be the sort of driver of innovation uh, towards all these next generation chemistries, either for sort of high performance, for aviation, uh, or other markets, uh, and for things like long duration storage, uh, I think data um, and uh, sort of high performance markets are sort of two things that I think uh, 2.0 batteries uh, will be about. James. All right. So I'm getting the impression we're talking a, a step change, you know, kind of feeding off of what the previous panelists have said. Battery 2.0 is a, is a step change from where we're at now, some, some new application, uh, real change, not just the incremental improvements that we've been talking about uh, as far as you know, higher nickel content or lessening the weight, lowering the cost. Uh, as you said, yeah, fundamentally lowering the cost would be a, a battery 2.0. And I, I still think that battery 1.0 still has a lot of legroom in the, in the sense that we're talking here. The, the cathode theoretical capacities, there's still a lot left in the tank there. Um, and even integration of things like the conversion-based anodes, not necessarily a, a step change, just a, another larger increment of improvement. Um, and so, to me, battery 2.0 would actually possibly involve a fundamental change in the manufacturing processes themselves. Uh, 
Right now, we're pretty much just in the process we have now because of magnetic tape decks in the 80s and CDs in the 90s. A whole lot of equipment came offline. Someone found, figured out a way to use that equipment for something that could make some money with it. And we just keep on making all these incremental changes with it. And when I think of the truly next generation energy storage technologies, some of them are not entirely compatible with uh, this tape casting method that we use now, where we have um, you know, solid particles and the interfaces of solid particles are difficult to control. I'm sure there's, uh, everyone's fairly aware of the solid electrolyte interface issues and columbic efficiency issues that ultimately lead to poor shelf life um, and poor cycle life and many other problems. These are all surface science, these are all interface issues, and they all come back to the manufacturing process. Uh, now there's certainly plenty of incremental changes we can do to improve it, different electrolytes, high voltage electrolytes, additives. All these things are battery 1.0 though. Uh, battery 2.0 uh, is more likely to be, in my mind, something like a solid state battery, which would probably involve a different manufacturing process since the inherent porosity created um, in traditional manufacturing is not entirely compatible with ideal solid state chemistries. So it should surprise no one that my vision for battery 2.0 involves data. It's very heavily data centric and I appreciate Venkat's uh, remarks along, along those lines. But to flesh that out a little further, um, what we see is, you know, if you look at batteries today, uh, every battery that's doing anything, you know, even remotely valuable or important, uh, is, is generating data, uh, whether it's in a test lab, uh, whether it's during the manufacturing process, during the formation cycling that happens toward the end of that process, uh, whether it's being integrated into a product or used uh, in an application or then uh, repurposed at the end of life. There is data being collected on those batteries all across that chain. And so our vision for uh, battery 2.0 is really to connect those dots throughout the, the full life cycle of a battery um, so that you have sort of traceability of that battery's uh, origin and how it's performed and sort of what its health and what its quality is throughout that life cycle. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we sort of see that in our work with our customers sort of being pulled in that direction, sort of both up and down the supply chain in terms of uh, there being a desire for uh, more data exchange and transparency between the material suppliers and the manufacturers the manufacturers and the you know, consumer electronics or electric vehicle applications. And then even once they ship those products out the door uh, with the financial community that's going to be ensuring those fleets of vehicles or those uh, batteries on the grid at scale. And so we sort of see data as the layer that connects all those dots and, uh, and can facilitate that future vision. Perfect. So I've got one more general question for you guys and we'll uh, break it down to individual questions or questions from the audience. So please, if you're thinking of things, uh, enter them now. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, a couple years ago, I was uh, drafted to a National Academies panel and, and I did an assessment of ARPA-E. Part of the exercise was to assess their energy storage portfolio. And at the time, they, uh, circa 2015, they had funded 63 separate storage-related projects to the tune of somewhere between 200 and $250 million, depending on how you count cost sharing. Um, at the same time, DOE had founded uh, uh, you know, a variety of centers, uh, the biggest one which of J is Jay Caesar that's hosted at Argonne National Lab. Um, and so that was a big sort of focal point of DOE along with all these different projects that were more innovation centric at RPE. Um, and NSF had a handful of things as well. So there was a general huge uptick in uh, funding from the U.S. government uh, that spurned a lot of this, as I mentioned. The question that I have to you guys is, and we've all benefited from it one way or another, uh, is it still going in the right direction? Uh, does, should R&D policy or R&D around energy storage or batteries uh, be altered given all we've talked about, battery 1.0, battery 2.0, knowing that in Asia there are, you know, in, in, there are rooms with hundreds of PhDs who are doing incremental improvement on the current technologies um, and they are doing it in a brutal way that is hard to compete with. Um, what happens here to, 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 to do the next thing that's going to matter, that's going to move the bar? Uh, and is this a, an R&D function for the government or is this something that should be more or venture-based? I think uh, in the spectrum of R&D, what I would like to see more of is uh, focus on the D, the development portion of it. Uh, and in particular, I think about a learning curve, like a right curve. Uh, where the, the total volume of production 
is, is correlated to a, a, an exponential price decline. And in order to achieve the value of that learning curve, we need to produce the volume. Uh, and so lithium ion has that advantage. It is producing at volumes that are increasing year over year. Uh, if we're going to see new technologies compete, we have to give them a shot at more than the R level. Uh, and, and that has to be a national priority if we are going to be the ones that are going to capture that flag in the United States. Uh, it certainly is a national priority uh, in China. For instance, they're making an 800 megawatt hour flow battery. Uh, and you know, will it cost down? I don't know, but the only way to find out is to, you know, is to fund the development effort as well as the research effort. Just to follow up on that, uh, I think that there needs to be sort of more crosstalk between R and D. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that um, work a lot on either R or either D, um, and I think there's very little crosstalk. Uh, in my own experience, and I think some of my students will attest to this, when uh, you have that link uh, to folks that are, uh, that are constantly thinking about development, um, that fundamentally changes your landscape in terms of how you think about research, uh, how you think about framing your question, uh, and uh, and uh, you sort of uh, know um, whether what you do uh, will ever make a difference. And I think that's a really important thing that um, I think some of the agencies like TOE uh, and RPE um, encourage. Uh, of course, the challenge uh, with uh, many of that kind of funding uh, comes uh, sort of challenging uh, milestones and deliverables uh, that um, uh, you know is, is sometimes hard to predict with uh, such ambitious projects, um, and, uh, and, and uh, obviously when you want to try and bring anything new, uh, you have to also assume that the current technology is going to get uh, so much better, um, and, and so uh, you have to uh, assume that you can beat them five years from now. So uh, I think there are some uh, pieces that are very good um, with how uh, uh, RPE and, and, uh, and DOE um, um, uh, elements that they have in their funding model, uh, but there are, I think, um, taking a longer term view uh, is of course challenging, but I think would be something that uh, would greatly benefit these sorts of very ambitious projects. All right, I think uh, I'm definitely agreeing on uh, particularly the R&D separation there. That's definitely something at the BIC that we've seen a lot where, you know, in coin cell testing, for instance, seems like they've solved every problem you could imagine. Uh, and they're so satisfied with that result, and then they try to scale it up, and, and oftentimes that coin cell result was uh, fairly meaningless. So by, by coin cell, just to be clear for the audience, these are very, very tiny test cells. They're tens of milligrams of active materials, but it proves function, and it's very, easy is the wrong word, but it's more common to get stellar results from something small, but of course you have several orders of magnitude more area of the same material, even in a regular battery, and then much more difficult, right? Exactly, I mean, exactly. Matter. And yeah. the, the, the free volume uh, available in that cell is so much more as far as the coin cell is concerned, the electrolyte to active mass ratio. There's just so many things that on a more geometric basis for that format just don't translate very well. Um, and uh, additionally, as far as the uh, funding side goes, I do, because uh, as a BIC, we uh, don't often uh, look to get our own grants. We usually partner with different entities that have, you know, some piece of technology um, and we'll partner with them on a grant to, to facilitate it. And so we've seen a whole lot of different applications and the ones that succeed and don't. Um, and I would generally, I generally think that the better ones do tend to succeed, although the ones that promise the most get the grants the most as well, which is which is some, some of what of a challenge, I think, but that's hard to, um, hard to fight against. Obviously, the person promising the most is, is the most enticing. Or the um, biggest liar. Yeah, yeah, that's, well, or the most optimistic. You can just be, I like to be, I like to be positive and just say they were the most optimistic uh, researchers. Uh, but yes, I, I do think that, that that step between early research and, and, and later development and scale up it could be bridged a lot more, and that's really what the BIC is all about, was, was creating that bridge. Um, and I think we've had some success in that. Great. So I'm going to echo uh, a couple of things that, that were said uh, just now, which is that I think uh, a major priority going forward for uh, battery R&D is to develop metrics so that you can actually compare uh, different technologies on a level playing field. 
And so broadly speaking, um, you know, when you're developing new battery technology, the things you're concerned with are how much energy can it hold, how much power can it deliver, how long can you cycle it, how many times can you charge and discharge it, uh, how much does it cost, and how safe is it. Um, and so, you know, I think that it would be great if there were some priority around developing a standard set of metrics to evaluate every technology along those different axes. It would be fairly straightforward to uh, propose, you know, for different applications, whether it's transportation, grid storage, et cetera, which ones are more important, how they should be weighted. Um, but, you know, it's sort of, I think that there's an issue in that um, you hear so often in the media the sort of the stories that bubble up to the media about the newest battery breakthrough and somebody has a technology that can, you know, will be able to charge your car in 10 seconds, your electric vehicle in 10 seconds, or what have you. Um, but almost invariably there's some, one of those acts, one or more of those axes of performance uh, is sort of being hidden and not talked about. Um, and those are important and very relevant. And so I think some, you know, uh, making it a priority in terms of research funding and where those resources go, being able to evaluate these things so you can separate out sort of the, the science projects or the, you know, the hero cells where you have one battery that runs for 10,000 cycles, you have no idea why. Um, uh, but from the ones who can generate statistically significant results that can be compared and, uh, and used to make those, those uh, priority decisions. Perfect. And, and I haven't forgot, I, actually Matt, I want, to, I want to pull you in here for a second. I want you to dial back yourself a good eight or nine years. Uh, what you might not know about Matt is that he was at General Electric uh, for a little while. How many years? Two years? Uh, two, two very long years, yes. Yeah, and you were on the, the GE Durathon battery team. So you, That's correct. this is sort of, a, it's an interesting historical. I'm gonna bring this into to, uh, corporate R&D for batteries just, to, just so you know. But uh, GE bought, purchased a company called Beta Battery, right? And then they decided they were gonna scale this. It was a high temperature, uh, uh, what was it, a nickel-sodium? So, sodium nickel-chloride, yeah. sodium yeah. nickel-chloride battery. And uh, they poured how much money into it? Uh, hundreds of millions? Yeah, at least. Uh, hundreds of millions into manufacturing, the team, the, yeah, the clean rooms, everything. And what happened? Uh, it's it's no, no longer operable. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and, uh, and so my, my question really is corporate-wise, uh, the GEs of the world, I mean, are they diving back into new batteries or not? Like, what's, where, do, where do people stand? So I, I don't think so. I don't think we're gonna see any, personally, I don't think you're gonna see any big, you know, Fortune 100 company that's gonna go and start you know, research from the ground up. I think what all those big companies are doing is hoping that either something gets through, like Ted said, right, the D part of it, where they can go out and deploy, or they're very content right now just to buy off the shelf lithium ion cells from whoever's the lowest cost supplier, package them together and uh, sell it for whatever margin they can. I, I don't think you'll, you'll see any research coming out of the big companies. Yeah, and then the other indicator is Sony, uh, actually the first company to market lithium ion batteries, Sony is sort of divesting their battery assets. They're uh, getting out of the business. It's a, sort of seen as a race to the bottom, low margin, uh, high risk kind of situation. So as we think about R&D uh, moving forward, uh, there's this open question, well, who's going to take over the tech and, and, you know, if we have something that's so different, a new chemistry, solid state that requires a different manufacturing infrastructure, who's going to own that? Who's going to put up the multiple billions to overcome? So there's this tension between incremental improvement of our current, uh, you know, approach and then the opposite, which is this sort of, uh, if you're going to make a difference in a radical way, who's going to foot the bill? Uh, we've got breakthrough. Energy Ventures and other folks like that who are willing to seed and support for years, but can they convert? Can they make the thing? This is going to be an interesting question about Battery 2.0. I think the story is largely about converting to that like large-scale production of things. Uh, we have about five minutes left. Uh, one of the audience questions. Discuss raw material supply issues as, battery, as, as we scale batteries globally. Um, what do you guys think the, the raw materials pain points are? Dave mentioned in his talk, Cobalt and Lithium. Uh, is this true? Uh, and uh, is there something else we should be looking at as well? Anybody? Thank you. Or sure. um, so um, I, I think some of this is overstated. Obviously, Cobalt is the most challenging. Uh, I think at least one way I think about it is, um, uh, is you, you, you have to sort of think about um, whether uh, the control of production of that particular material uh, is, uh, is controlled by one country or many countries. And so for nearly all other materials, uh, including lithium, and, and we're not going to run short of lithium, the simple arithmetic that you can do, uh, all you need uh, is one mole of lithium and one mole of transition metal. Lithium is so light, so you, you can do a back of the envelope looking back at your periodic table and know that you, know, you need one-tenth of lithium 
uh, for transition metals. So um, lithium is likely not going to be the bottleneck. Um, um, cobalt, maybe there are, there are many options related to uh, sort of low cobalt. Um, so uh, of course, I think this is a challenge, but I don't think uh, this is something that is going to be a huge showstopper. Yeah, and I could yeah, I could add to that. Um, I would agree, and I, I think though that where it blends together with where it can be challenging is the price fluctuation. It's the industry is large enough now that you know the mining consortiums are actually going to these you know battery shows and, and uh, they're they're paying attention to the industry since there's so much being bought now that it actually affects the decisions on whether to open up and mine more. Uh, I, I definitely think, it, particularly nickel and, and the others other than cobalt, that as demand increases, supply will follow. You'll have those delays that you can have, just like you know, even with oil, sometimes supply and demand don't quite match up and the price skyrockets. I think that's one case where um, batteries have a little bit more flexibility um, an example would be uh, a cell that I dissected recently. It was technically they were lying about the cell, but still, they, it worked. The cell worked. They just lied about what was in it. LCO recently got very much more expensive, and so they blended in NMC, and it had the same performance characteristics. It worked. Uh, they should have been honest about it, but still, it, it leads to what you can do when we have these flexible chemistries. If one particular element uh, suddenly gets expensive, we can shift um, among a few choices. And, and just for the audience, uh, newcomers to batteries, LCL is lithium cobalt oxide, NMC is lithium nickel cobalt manganese oxide, and they have different ratios. And the idea is to play the game of reducing the amount of expensive things like cobalt and nickel while increasing the amount of manganese without having a, a crappy battery. And there's, it's funny how nature works there. The, the cheaper the material, the worse the battery oftentimes. And I, I don't know how, the, how they know. Yeah, the whole, the world knows, but the whole industry is just this trade-off. Yeah. Every time you it's get strange. one performance metric, you're usually sacrificing another, which yes. is where you were leading before. Is, you know, even with traditional chemistries, you can make a special form of that battery that will make one stat look amazing. Yeah, That's exactly right. Um, so maybe time for, for one more question. And I'm trying to sort of... Um, so here, one thing that's also an undercurrent right now from a... a a research perspective going forward, I think in all, in all areas that we talk about, especially here at CMU, is computational power. Is it machine learning? Is it big data? Is it assessment? Is it materials discovery? There's so many different flavors of it, and I know we're chasing it here in multiple areas uh, within CMU, um, and maybe Venka can comment a little bit on that. But uh, how about you other folks, too? Uh, what is the future of uh, all this new computational power that we're seeing coming online? How is this going to impact what we do? So last question, go down the line. One observation I had about, about that, uh, when I said that technology development will be market driven, it, there's stuff that is possible today that we just never could have done 10, 15 years ago. For example, on the market side, we can now get multiple 20 year data sets, hourly uh, resolution wind, uh, and uh, make some assumptions about different battery characteristics and run a techno-economic model to run optimizing scenarios for what combination of solar plus storage or wind plus storage or both uh, creates the cost minimizing uh, levelized cost of electricity. Uh, that kind of stuff was never possible before and that, that helps us tease out new sets of market requirements that feed into the product development process so we can say how important is efficiency? And you know, one striking realization we had uh, was that if you're looking in a, to a future where there's a one cent per kilowatt hour uh, PPA, uh, efficiency is less important than we thought. And that relaxing that design constraint uh, can really change your options for technology development. And that, that kind of market-based computation just was not possible. And just to be clear, when, when Ted says we, he means the Form Energy team. And Form, and by the way, was the first investment of, from Dave Danielson's team in BEV. So it's ultra long duration storage and they're figure out a way to, to crack that, that problem. So we have just a minute left or less, so please, uh, fast and concise. Uh, Eli is probably going to talk about data, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, the, the piece related to being able to do everything on the computer, never have to test, and then the experiment is just validation. Um, and you might think this is pie-in-the-sky idea, but the steel industry has gotten there with CalFAD, 
uh, the thermodynamics models are so good that you know, experimentation is largely validation. Um, where are we on getting there uh, with batteries? Uh, we're not there yet. The materials project has made phenomenal progress at, at sort of collecting the data and, and trying to sort of build that piece. Uh, but in 10 years, uh, I would be very surprised if uh, we cannot, with 99% accuracy, predict the voltage curve of any battery material. I will be very quick because I don't do a lot of software and just agree with you that, that that's where the direction would go. <laughs> Uh, so I'll say two quick things. Uh, one thing that we see happening is, um, you know, we think that right now it's happening with lithium. The costs are going down. Things are becoming commoditized. Uh, we see that following a similar sort of trajectory to the semiconductor market over the last couple decades, where they went from being uh, very expensive, relatively rare, to now they're ubiquitous and, generally speaking, very cheap, very low margin business, hard business. So there's a tremendous amount of optimization to be done in uh, throughout that supply chain and manufacturing chain that's going to be enabled by computers and data analysis. And then the second thing that I'll say is, uh, in terms of deploying these systems at scale, uh, somebody needs to pay for them. They need to be financed. They need to be insured. Uh, all that capital hates uncertainty. There's still a tremendous amount of uncertainty around how these systems are going to perform in the field. So again, going back to the data thing, it's going to be about collecting a lot of data and then being able to uh, model that and model the financial implications of the actual physical state of the battery, not just modeling what the sort of how you optimize when you charge and discharge to maximize the revenues. All right, well, without uh, taking up any more time, I want to thank you guys. I want to I I throw a last question back sure. at you right. so that uh, I think everyone wants to know what battery 2.0 uh, in Jay's mind is. So I think we should close with that. Uh, uh, that's a, it's a, it's a fair question. Um, wow, I, I don't know yet. Actually, I'm thinking about battery 3.0. I'm sitting battery 2.0 out. And I'm waiting for you guys to do that. And then I will follow up with battery 3.0 in about six or seven years. No, I think that, to be honest with you, I think that the answer is um, some hybrid of uh, what Ted is going after um, and what some of the lithium ion folks are going after. I think we have to find, uh, battery 2.0 for me, because of the incredible uh, pressure from a manufacturing infrastructure uh, perspective to devote immense capital to scale down to cost, we have to design batteries that are useful for both stationary and mobile applications somehow. Um, and this is hard to do because the, an, an optimized battery for a car is totally different than a battery that's optimized for stationary storage um, right now. And if we could find a way to create a silver bullet chemistry or cell configuration or something that will allow for both of those markets to be served per perfectly or well, um, because right now, like Tesla's solution of putting its battery cells into a package and hanging on a wall is not actually a good stationary storage plate. It just, it's not. I mean, it, it's great that Tesla's doing it and they're popularizing the idea, but electrochemically, it's not the right answer. So battery 2.0, in my mind, or maybe 3.0, is something that is both, that can do both things. Um, because you'd love to leverage the two, uh, you know, the two markets, and people talk about doing it now, but it's more difficult. So with that. Thank our audience. Thank our audience. Thank our audience.